Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 12th of December, so really not that long till Christmas. Uh, as always, if this is useful, please like, subscribe, comment, and share, and hit that bell icon to get notified of new content. As always, in the description, I have the chapters for the new updates. You can click along the bottom of the screen if you want to jump to a specific update. New videos this week. So I spent a lot of time researching and creating this deep dive all about Azure Active Directory resiliency. What does Microsoft do to make Azure AD resilient? And then what are some of the things we can do to increase that resiliency? Now, I don't often kind of say this, but this is something everyone should watch, whether you're an administrator, an architect, a developer. This is critical knowledge to have. So very, very highly five-star recommend, watch that one. Then I also did an overview of the new native SFTP capability in Azure Storage that I mentioned in last week's update. So if you want a bit more detail and see that in action, I kind of walk through that and some of the other considerations. Getting on to what's new this week, so we have this new VM restore point in preview. So this gives me a point in time and really important multi-disc app consistent snapshot capability that can then help with backup and restore scenarios. So previously we had for a managed disk, I could do a managed disk snapshot, but that was just that single disk. Well, if I have multiple disks for a virtual machine, for it to really be useful, I want snapshots on all of them at the same instant in time. So I get consistency across them. And I want it to be app consistent. So app consistent means when I take this new VM restore point, it's actually gonna interact with the guest operating system. It will use things like VSS for Windows to tell the applications running that have providers to flush out the changes to disk, pause, quiesce any changes. Then it can take that multi-disk snapshot and they can carry on running. So it's not saving the memory of the VM as part of this, but it doesn't need to because it's got the disks in that app consistent state. The way it's actually working is you create a restore point collection and that restore point collection then has a particular VM restore point created inside it that consists of all of the various disk snapshots, those disk restore points for all of the attached disks. So it's gonna store the configuration and all of those snapshots as part of it. It is incremental after the first one. So that first VM restore point will be the entire content of all of the disks. But then after that, it's just the incrementals and it will use ZRS if available in the region. If not, it will be LRS. On the storage side, so blob immutable storage with versioning has gone GA. So the whole point of immutable storage is that whole, hey, I write once and I can read many, but I can't, delete or modify once I've put a lock on the blob. That lock could be for time, or it could be a legal hold. Now what this capability does, it now applies to blob and all previous versions, but what I can now do is once I turn this on, I can still write, I can modify the blob. I can't delete it, I can't change the user metadata, but I can change the blob. But what it will do is it will create a immutable version of the blob. So I've still saved the state at the time that hold was actually applied. So what I can actually do, once I've got versioning turned on for the storage account, what you would see is, so you have to obviously go to the data protection and go and turn on the versioning capability. So if you kind of look in here, I've got soft delete, versioning for blobs, etc. But then when I go and create a container, what you can now specify is this, hey, I want to do this version level immutability support. So once I turn that on, as it kind of says to you here, hey, blob overwrites will still be allowed, but Azure will maintain the immutable versions by using those version capabilities. So that's what this capability is gonna give us. It's gonna let us now hey, I can still actually modify it, but keep that particular version because we're gonna create a version of it. Azure Storage Attribute-Based Access Control using those Azure AD Custom Security Attributes I showed last week 
is now in preview. Now I demoed all of this last week, so I'm not gonna demo it again, but it's basically the idea that, hey, I can have those custom attributes on, for example, my users, and then I have my blob index tags, and rather than having to have a whole set of different rules for access, I can now have one rule, in fact, I could show you that one rule, since I'm in this storage account anyway. So if I actually go into images, and I look at my access control, if I look at my role assignments, if I look at um, yeah, blob data reader, I have a custom attribute of my account, which is a primary project, and then I can compare that to a project blob index tag. So here, based on the security principle, hey, I'm looking at this project attribute set and this primary project actually custom attribute, then I want it to equal the blob index tag value that was within the key project. And so I don't have to have a ton of different rules, it's just, hey, my particular object has a particular project in this example, it has to match the project to the blob index tag. And now it's one rule, and I can have tons of different projects, I can only see what is my project. And there's a ton of other combinations I can do with that. But now the storage account preview can match that. And Azure Storage Service Endpoints now in preview support any region. So if we remember super quickly, the whole point of a service endpoint is ordinarily we have, for example, a, a storage account. That storage account has that firewall where I can control what is allowed to talk to it. Well, with a regular virtual network, it's an RFC 1918 IP address, there's no way to really reference that. So if we think about it, there's lots of subnets in here, I can add a service endpoint for storage, and now this particular subnet in this particular VNet now becomes identifiable. I get an improved routing option, but now also on the firewall, I can say yes, allow um, subnet one in VNet one. And before that was only allowed for storage account in the same um, region or the paired region. But now with this enhancement, it's uh, gonna support any region. So it gives me a lot more flexibility actually for that. Miscellaneous, so PowerShell AZ module version seven has been released. Now this is actually quite a big release because it's making the switch to the Microsoft Graph. What that might mean is if you have certain um, security service principles, you may need to go in and consent to certain scopes. So just make sure you retest things if you make that update, because obviously the MS Graph is all based around consent of scopes, whereas we didn't have that before. So just make sure you, you go and check those things. Defender for Cloud has a bunch of updates. Actually, I think it was two main updates. So if we go and look at this super quick. So... The new Defender for Containers plan has been released for general availability. So that's a combination of some existing things there were. Talks about some onboarding. Some new alerts for storage. Uh, publicly accessible storage containers uh, discovered. And then unsuccessfully scanned. And then some improvements to alerts around Defender for Storage. Access from a Tor exit node. Uh, unusual unauthenticated access. And as usual, I'll just have the link to this uh, down in the description below if you wanna actually go and check out that detail directly. Availability zones are now available in India Central. Remember availability zones are those independent power calling communications per facility. So it gives me a, a nice blast radius if there's a building level problem well, my instances in the other availability zones should not be impacted. And then Container Insights for Azure Red Hat OpenShift v4 is retiring end of May. The point is, really, you want to shift and move to the Azure Arc. So I can shift to the Container Insights for Azure Arc. Remember, Azure Arc for containers works for any CNCF compatible Kubernetes. So rather than having something specific for the Red Hat OpenShift, the better option is to use the Azure Arc for Kubernetes 
and then use the container insights that sits on top of that. And because Red Hat OpenShift is CNCF compliant, that will work with the Azure Arc for Kubernetes, which means I can use the container insights, which gives me automatic monitoring agent updates, better metric-based alerting, better onboarding. It's just an all-up improved experience. So start thinking about moving away from that specific solution and instead going over to the Azure Arc for Kubernetes-based solution. And that's it. So I hope that was useful. And uh, I guess credit in the comments if you know what my favorite Christmas movie is. And uh, until next week, take care.